A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his, cloth, his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along. But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Jesus asked, now which of these three would you say was the neighbor to the man who was attacked? The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Compassion. Compassion is a word that we just don't always understand. I mentioned before that in the Greek texts, um, there's, the, there's the section where Jesus is by himself and he sees all the people and says, he had compassion on them. That's so generic. That's so, oh, he had compassion. He felt sorry for them. No, the, the actual, the Greek word, means from the very bowels of himself, from the very bottom of his soul, he felt for these people. From the very bottom of his soul, from the very being of who he was, he saw these people and he felt for these people. He had compassion. A few of you have asked me, how was my vacation? And I have to admit that my vacation, and I hope I make it through this okay, my vacation was really about spiritual growth. I wasn't expecting it. But the Holy Spirit steps in wherever you want, he wants to see you. As you know, Nick graduated from the uh, religious services chaplain school, chaplain assistant school. And I was so taken, not by the graduation service, not by the picture we took to each other, but I was so taken by the, the last day that we spent together. We went and toured the USS Yorktown, state, which is in, in Char Charleston Harbor. And that morning, as we toured the ship, we got to a place that there was a plaque on the door, and it hit me upside the head like a two-by-four. It was a room that started with a C. What do you think it was? Chapel. And you know how you go into a hospital chapels, and they're like this little closet almost, and they don't have much in there? And That's kind of what I was expecting when we were walking through the door. Walking through the door, and there is, in essence, a small sanctuary set up with pews and an altar, set up with pictures. The, the, the chaplain who last served on that just died in, in uh, uh, 2022, I think it was. 2020, I think it was. There's a picture of him, but there's pictures on the wall showing the different chaplains that had served on uh, carriers and destroyers. One of them was was Father O'Callaghan. There's a Catholic name for you. And Father O'Callaghan, he was in the picture, and he was kneeling, giving last rites to a soldier on the deck, an aircraft carrier that had just gotten hit. And that kind of opened my eyes to what the chaplaincy in the army it's about. It's about guys like you and me who are trained, who go in and do very, very special ministry, much like the Good Samaritan today. I've got some notes that I'm going to use for myself, so I'm not browsing on my phone, but rather I have some things I want to tell you about. Civil War 
it was decided that chaplains would be a very important thing to have. And they recruited pastors and lay people to come be part of part of ministering to the people on the battlefield. It wasn't until 1918 that the uh, original chaplain school was opened. Why was it? Because they needed combat training. The, the chaplains needed to know how to do combat training. Needed to have combat training. Because they were going to be in situations you wouldn't imagine. In World War I, they were trained because chaplains worked very closely with non-combatants, with the surgical people, the ambulance crew, the stretcher bearers, the first aid stations. They were providing both physical and spiritual care to the wounded and the dying. Their jobs then were to be with the people and burying the people as they died, taking them to the graves, registering the graves, and doing graveside services for them. Compassion. It kind of takes a compassionate soul to do some of the things that I learned about. It's kind of like the priest who walked by and the temple uh, assistant who walked by. But the chaplains did not walk by. One World War II soldier reported this. Staying here. I'm sorry, this is World War, yeah, World War II. That's all the captain said. He looked up for just a moment. We were in a forward position and the chaplain was Nade station. Talking to the wounded when suddenly we were told that there was going to be an overwhelming Japanese attack. Non-combatants were ordered to the rear and the chaplain had plenty of time to leave when I told him to, but he just said, I'm staying here. And he did. And throughout most of the attack, he was with the wounded, talking with them. Comforting them. And he gave his life to minister to them. In World War II and other wars, some POWs, some chaplains were taken as POWs. And they found that life in a prisoner of war camp was horrible. I mean, you don't think it would be the Hilton, right? But it was very bad for, for people of religion, and especially people who taught religion or preached religion, because it was felt that they were spreading propaganda. And so specifically in the Japanese POW camps, they would have secret groups or secret prayers And the pastors would write a sermon, handwrite a sermon, tie it to a rock, throw it over to the fence, over the fence, to where there were other POWs. Compassion. Doing ministry, not in beautiful robes and colorful stoles. Doing ministry in the dregs of hell. And not because they were being paid to, but because the Spirit was leading them to. It's just like Paul. Paul sending out letters in the prisons. Now, prisons were not, I don't think, like, like the POW camps by far. Some of the things we hear about Paul being in prison 
It wasn't quite the Hilton, but they gave him a lot of leeway. But in World War II, chaplains increasingly went into the active um, battles, into the, what do they call it, the um, uh, arena. During World War II alone, there were 478 chaplains killed. People doing ministry out of the compassion of their heart who gave up who gave up their lives who did not pass by the man along the street who stopped stood was there with them bound up their wounds you know it's interesting I don't know if it's still on the books if it is cool if it's not I apologize I know it used to be there was a good Samaritan law named after the Good Samaritan parable still on the books you must stop and give aid like chaplain Charles Waters He was ministering to people on a battlefield. He was giving last rites. And he knew it was a dangerous place to go. While he was giving last rites, a bomb fell and killed 42 people, including Chaplain Waters. Where do you do ministry? Where do we do ministry as a congregation? What do we do? Do we stay here in the, in the confines of our clean and, and homogenistic uh, sanitary sanctuary? Or do we go out where the people are lying on the streets? Do you go out where the people are lying on the streets. Honey, can I share the pizza story? Renee, while I was gone, was at a Pampered Chef um, convention in Chicago, and I'm telling you what, they were wandering the streets of Chicago at 10 o'clock. They had gone down to get this great pizza. And there was, what, four pieces left? Is that what you said? That they took home? And the lady who bought the pizza, they came upon a homeless man. And the lady who bought the pizza gave it to him. And you would have thought that she had given him the lottery. Down in Fort Lauderdale, we fed the homeless many times. But you know what? The homeless were not, a, were not a, some people that were wanted. And so it became illegal to feed the homeless in Fort Lauderdale. The, the, the council passed an ordinance saying, if you give somebody pizza and, you're so, and someone sees you, you can be arrested. There was an 80-some-year-old pastor who had been doing it for 40 years who was arrested three or four times before I left. Because he said, this is what I'm called to do. Where do we do ministry? Where do you do ministry? I just want to share one final closing story. At the Chaplin Museum, there was some medals with four people, four pictures of four people. There's, this was written by John Brinesfeld, and I'm just going to read it because it is so poetic. It was February 3rd, 1943, in the U.S. Army Transport Docher, 
was one of the three ships in a convoy moving across the Atlantic from Newfoundland to the American base in Greenland. A converted luxury liner, the Dorchester, was, crowned, uh, was crowded to capacity, carrying 902 servicemen. It was only 150 miles from the destination when shortly after midnight, an officer aboard the German submarine U-2, uh, uh, submarine U-2 uh, spotted it. After identifying the target the sh and the ship, he gave orders to fire, and the hit was decisive, striking the ship far below the waterline. The initial blast killed scores of men and seriously wounded more. Others, stunned by the explosion, were groping in the darkness. Panic and chaos quickly set in. Men were screaming, others crying, or frantically trying to get lifeboats off the ship. Through the pandemonium, four men spread out among the soldiers, calming the frightened, tending the wounded, and guiding the disoriented toward safety. They were four army chaplains. Lieutenant George Fox, a Methodist. Lieutenant Alexander Good, a Jewish rabbi. Lieutenant John Washington, a Roman Catholic priest. And Lieutenant Clark Poling, a Dutch reform minister. Quickly and quietly, the four chaplains worked to bring calm to the men. The soldiers began to find their way to the deck of the ship. Many were still in their underwear, where they were confronted by the cold winds blowing down from the Arctic. Petty Officer John Mahoney, reeling from the cold, headed back towards the cabin. Where are you going? A voice of calm in the sea distre of distress asked. To get my gloves, Mahoney replied. Here, take these, said Rabbi Good, as he handed a pair of gloves to the young officer. I can't take those gloves, Mahoney replied. Never mind, the rabbi responded. I have two pairs. It was only long after that that Mo Mahoney realized that the chaplain never intended to leave the ship. Once topside, the chaplain opened a storage locker and began, the chaplains opened a storage locker and began distributing life jackets. It was then that engineer Grady, uh, Grady Clark witnessed an astonishing sight. When there were no more life jackets in the storage room, the chaplains simultaneously removed theirs and gave them to four frightened young men. Remember this part. When giving their life jackets, Rabbi Good did not call out for a Jew. Father Washington did not call out for a Catholic, nor did Fox or Poling call out for Protestants. They simply gave their life jacket to the next man in line. One survivor would say later, It was the finest thing I have seen or hope to see this side of heaven. As the ship went down, survivors in nearby rafts could see the four chaplains, arms linked, embraced against the slanting deck. Their voices also could be heard offering prayers and hymns. Compassion. Just like the Samaritan, we are called to have compassion on those around us. We are called, if needed, to give our lives for those who are in need. Jesus is my homeboy. He's got us. We have to have we have to be the homeboy for those people who are in need of the good word. I'm sorry for the tears this morning. But this is just, my vacation was a, a spiritual growth moment. Yes, I'm proud of Nick, but I'm also thankful for the things the Holy Spirit showed me. Compassion. Now go this, go do this unto others, is what Jesus said. 
I say to you, now go do this unto others. Amen.